All right, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. HMO man is, sounds better than what my lab calls me, which is sugar daddy. Um, so I take the uh, HMO man. So we're talking about human milk oligosaccharides. Up front, a couple of disclosures where the funding is coming from, and another disclosure that all of this work would not be possible without the people in my lab and without the many collaborators in the U.S. and really around the world. So I'd like to start my slides with putting this a little bit into perspective and showing you one slide uh, with a statement that came from the Lancet Breastfeeding Series from the editorial 2016 that says that the death of 823,000 infants and 20,000 mothers each year could be averted through universal breastfeeding, along with economic savings of 300 billion U.S. dollars. And we really tried to answer the question, why is that? What's behind that statement? How does that work on a molecular level? So if you lift the curtain of this statement, really, and look at what is in human milk, and you just look at the macromolecules, you see there's protein, fat, the milk sugar lactose, but there's also oligosaccharides. Five to 15 gram per liter. That often exceeds the total amount of protein in human milk. If you compare that to bovine milk, there's about 100 to 1,000 fold less oligosaccharides in bovine milk. And since bovine milk is the basis for most infant formula, there's hardly any human milk oligosaccharides in infant formula, which is changing now. And that's why almost every session at this conference seems to have something to do with oligosaccharides, because it's really the hot topic. Oligosaccharides are making an entrance into infant formula. So what are human milk oligosaccharides, or short HMOs? They are complex sugars, unlike the sugar that you have uh, in your food, in your coffee, which to me is already complicated enough. Uh, human milk oligosaccharides are complex molecules built off different monosaccharide building blocks. And to make this whole thing a little bit easier, we give each building block a symbol. And that makes it much easier to talk about these molecules. So human milk oligosaccharides really only have five building blocks. It's glucose and galactose, which we know from lactose. And then there is N-acetylglucosamine, fucose, and silic acid. Five building blocks. It's almost like Lego bricks. And depending on how you put those Lego bricks together, you either get a car, and if you put them together differently, you get a little plane. And you can imagine car and plane have different functions. If you're going all out and you're like my daughter, you build this thing here out of Lego, uh, she, for some strange reason, wanted to have the Millennium Falcon with almost 2,000 pieces uh, for Christmas, so it's not that complicated. This is how oligosaccharides look like. So uh, in the corner here in the blue space, I'm going to develop the, the HMO blueprint, and then the white space around that, I'm giving you a few examples of how these oligosaccharides look like. So all human milk oligosaccharides start with lactose at the reducing end. That's glucose and galactose. And then you can elongate those structures, all with the disaccharide units at a time, in different linkages, and you can branch those structures. And the more and more you add those disaccharide units to it, the structures become fairly complex, either linear or in a branched way. You can then modify these structures by adding fucose in different linkages. If you add fucose to lactose, you get two focosyl lactose that we hear a lot about, and three fucosyl lactose. And you can add it to the growing chain, and you get different oligosaccharides, different structural isomers, as we call it. So you count these four oligosaccharides on the bottom. Building blocks are the same. They're just put together differently. It's like the car and the plane. Then you can add silic acid to the molecule, which makes it a little bit more complicated, because silic acid contains a carboxyl group, and with that comes a negative charge. So every time you add a silic acid, you get a negative charge. If you add silic acid to lactose alone, you get three silactose and six silactose. And again, you can add it to the growing chain, different structures, and you can add multiple silic acids. So you see that down here on the bottom, desilacta and tetrose contains two silic acids. Key for this slide here really is that there is about 150 to 200 different oligosaccharides that have been identified. And really important is that every mom makes a different set of these oligosaccharides in different concentrations. You see that here in an example with the Canadian child cohort where we analyzed around 1,200 uh, samples so far. This is with Megan Azad as a collaborator. And on the bottom here, you see the different 
subjects, different milk samples that we analyzed, on the y-axis is your oligosaccharide concentration, different colors, different oligosaccharides. And just look at the left spectrum here and the right spectrum, how different that is, just in total amount of oligosaccharides. And if you then say, take the same data set and take it as absolute uh, values now turned into relative abundance, you see how different those patterns are. So again, every mom has a different, almost like a thumbprint of oligosaccharides that she makes. You can visualize this data slightly differently. Many of you have seen this from the microbiome field where you take data sets and reduce them to individual data points that you plot in a three-dimensional space in principal component analysis. So every spot here is a milk sample. The closer those spots are together, the more similar the oligosaccharide composition in those two samples. The further apart those spots, the more dissimilar the oligosaccharide composition. So you can see this spot up here, for example, has a very different oligosaccharide composition from this spot down here. But these three spots are very similar. Now, what maternal factors drive that variation in human milk oligosaccharide composition? One is genetics. Not much we can do about there. And if you go back to this data set and you color this slightly different now, you see these two clouds, one on the left and the large one on the right. And if we just go in the child data set, and the child cohort data set, 95% of that separation can be explained by one single nucleotide polymorphism. It's one base pair that's different in mom's DNA. One base pair changes the oligosaccharide composition in her milk dramatically. Now, we looked at that and did genome-wide association studies to uh, associate different oligosaccharides with different SNPs in the genome. And you see here in this Manhattan plot uh, the 23 uh, different chromosomes and associations with, in this case, 2FL. And you clearly see a signal pop out there on chromosome 19. And if you look at the p-values, that is negative uh, log of 80 or 90. So it's the zero point, and then comes 80 zeros, and then comes your one. And what is on chromosome 19 that is associated, it's FUT2. Now, what's FUT2? FUT2 stands for fucosyl transferase 2. So as the name says, it transfers fucose to your oligosaccharide backbone and in a specific linkage. So FUT2 here connects fucose in an alpha-1,2 linkage to your terminal galactose. There's other fucosyl transferases, like this fucosyl transferase 2, FUT3 and that adds fucose in different linkages, alpha-1,4, alpha-1,3, to the growing backbone. Now, women that have, or humans in general, that have this SNP in FUT2 introduce a premature stop codon, and FUT2 is completely inactive. So women that have that SNP do not have a FUT2, cannot make these underlying structures here. Uh, they still have a FUT3, so they have fucosylate structures differently. Vice versa, you have some moms that have no FUT3, but a FUT2. Their oligosaccharides look different. And then you have about 1% of the population that has neither a FUT2 nor a FUT3, and the oligosaccharides, again, look very different. So genetics play a huge role here, and that is, here's an example, reflecting in the oligosaccharide profile. If you compare moms that are secretors, so they have an active FUT2, peak number two here is the dominant peak, that's two focusal actors. Non-secreter moms with an inactive few 2 that have that SNP have no two focusal lactose. So it's an all or nothing. And that's the same for LNFP1 and other oligosaccharides. And together with Charlie McGuire, we've seen that that changes depending on where you are on the planet. For example, in Latin America, almost all moms are secretors. You have one or two percent of the moms that are non-secretors. That is very different if you look on the African continent. 25, 35, almost 40% of the moms are non-secretors. And we still haven't figured out why that is, why some infants or why some moms make a lot of 2FL, whereas other moms hardly make any. So that's genetics. And we still don't know what other genes are involved in that. The GWAS studies will get us closer to that. We also do a combination of genomics, transcriptomics, and HMOmics to really puzzle together the biosynthetic pathway of human milk oligosaccharides. Uh, so that's genetics, but what about the environment? Can we change human milk oligosaccharide composition by mom's diet, by certain supplements, physical activity? 
Other exposures. What happens if mom takes certain drugs? Does that change the oligosaccharide composition? How about time? Do oligosaccharides change over the course of lactation? Does it change if mom had already a child or if this is her first child? What about maternal health and disease in general? Moms with gestational diabetes, chronic inflammatory diseases, obesity, does that impact oligosaccharide composition or really milk composition in general? We're starting to get some answers to these, uh, to these questions. I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, really trying to answer a few questions here. What are human milk oligosaccharides actually doing? So it's great to know what maternal factors drive composition, but why would we want to know that if we don't know what the effect of different oligosaccharides are? So let's talk about infant outcomes, and I give you a laundry list of different outcomes that people have studied over the years and are actively studying, and you see it's really all over the place, and probably rightfully so. So many of these aspects here, both in the infant space but also in the adult space, might be affected by human milk oligosaccharides. And uh, if you see a lot of talks at this conference about oligosaccharides, I would uh, suggest that it's going to be even more talks in the future, because this field is really exploding. Before we get into the effects of oligosaccharides, let's take a look first at what happens to oligosaccharides when the infant ingests it with milk. They go in, they're fairly resistant to the low pH in the stomach and to pancreatic and brush border enzymes. About 1% is absorbed, appear intact in the urine, and the rest is either degraded in the colon or excreted intact, and you find it in the diaper. So this slide alone tells you already what we're going to talk about today, and that's microbiome and immune system. Bacterial degradation is one of the words on the slides. Microbiome. So that's one of the prime effects of human milk oligosaccharides, that they shape microbial communities in the infant gut. But also, 1% is absorbed. And I'll show you later that that's not a small amount, although for most food uh, articles you would say, oh, 1% is neglectable, but for human milk oligosaccharides that come in every two, three hours at that high concentration, we think that is a substantial amount that goes in. So let's talk about the bacterial degradation part first and all the stuff that happens in the intestine. Here's a figure that I took from uh, Chris Stewart's uh, recent Nature paper uh, where they looked specifically in the Teddy study what factors contribute to the variation in the microbiome the most. So what drives microbiome variation at different time points during development? And you see here that's the different month of infant life, three to six months, seven to 10, 11 to 14. And these are all the factors that they looked at that contribute to the variation in the infant microbiome. And you see this, this pink bar here that sticks out in the first three age categories, in the first year of life, really. And that is breast milk. So they came up with a conclusion that says, we showed that the first year of life is a key phase for the development of the microbiome, with the receipt of breast milk being the main factor that influences microbiome development over this period. How do human milk oligosaccharides play into that? I'm going to show you this uh, cartoon here over the next few minutes, where we're trying to develop the interaction between human milk oligosaccharides, good bacteria, potential pathogens over here, and then intestinal epithelial cells on the bottom. We know that oligosaccharides have prebiotic effects. So they serve as metabolic substrate for potentially beneficial microbes. And I'm going to show you some data here that we have both from animal studies but also ex vivo human. Uh, this is from a study that we did a while ago on necrotizing enterocolitis, where we feed neonatal rats with infant formula with and without oligosaccharides. And we then here, we looked at day of life two, just on a very high level, uh, how the microbiome changes in these animals. If you leave the pups here with the dam, that's the dam fed or breast fed control, you get a certain microbiota composition. If you feed them with formula, you can see the colors look very different without going into what's what. But if you add human milk oligosaccharides to the formula, you see that the composition of the microbiome comes back to where the damp fed control is, or at least close to it. 
We then wanted to see if, well, here we fed total human milk oligosaccharides. Do, have in, do individual oligosaccharides have differential effects on the microbiome? Does it matter what oligosaccharides we feed? And here we do a study with Karsten Zengler where we specifically take feces from breastfed infants, extract the microbial communities, culture them under anaerobic conditions, and then spike in different oligosaccharides to see how the microbiome develops. And again, on a just very high level, this is just OD600 looking at this right now, so just growth of bacteria. Uh, you can see that uh, bacteria grow over time if you feed them pooled human milk oligosaccharides that we extract from human milk. They also grow on LNT and 2FL at different concentrations, and there seems to be some concentration dependency. And Correspondingly, you see that the oligosaccharides are consumed, so you find them at 100% in medium at the start, and then they're gone after 24 to 48 hours. We repeated this experiment, and we found a very similar, different infant, different fecal sample, different community. Uh, the community is still growth on pooled oligosaccharides and LNT, but does not grow on 2 focosyl lactose. In fact, if we look at the tissue culture supernatant afterwards, there's hardly any consumption of 2FL after 48 hours. Well, it took us a little bit to find out what's going on here, and we realized when we analyzed the corresponding milk sample from this mom that this mom was a secretor. So she makes a lot of 2 focosyl lactose. Infant and infant microbiome were exposed to 2 focosyl lactose before, and apparently the microbiome knew what to do with it. Mother B, for infant B down here, however, was a non-secretor, does not provide any 2 focosyl lactose, and infant and infant gut microbiome had not been exposed to 2FL before. So apparently this microbial community had no idea what to do with 2FL and would just not grow the first 48 hours. Again, this is very high level. Uh, we're just going down a little bit lower, just looking at 16S sequencing again. Uh, same communities, and in this three-dimensional space, again, the closer the communities together, the dots together, the, similar, the more similar the communities, uh, we start here at T0, and then we move in this three-dimensional space, so the composition, composition changes on human milk oligosaccharide exposure over 24 and 48 hours, but it develops differently if you feed different oligosaccharides. So the composition of the microbiome now looks different, just on a very high level 16S, and that changes after 48 hours, and very different when you feed it to FL. So in other words, although these points here are almost similar, so the total amount of bacteria in that culture are the same, but the composition is different. So it's different bacteria. And you can go down other levels without showing that here where you do metagenomics and all other kinds of screens. It's very different. It depends on what oligosaccharides you feed. So bottom line, the prebiotic effects of human oligosaccharides are structure-specific. Not just because we call it a human milk oligosaccharide, it has the same effect. Different oligosaccharides have different effects. In addition, we think that HMOs are more than just food for bugs. For example, they have antimicrobial effects as well. So they act on pathogens and stop pathogen growth. Here's an example where we worked with Victor Nizé from Group B Streptococcus, where his postdoc literally sprinkled oligosaccharides on a few pathogens that she pulled out of the freezer, and she found that Group B Streptococcus on HMO exposure is just not growing anymore. And we tried this over and over in different uh, assays, and it still held true, and we identified one specific oligosaccharide that was responsible for that effect. So again, it's structure-specific. We also used a transposon mutant library to identify the target on GBS as a glycosyl transferase. We think uh, what the mechanism looks like, but this is just one example. If the postdoc had pulled out four different strains, we probably would have gotten different results and not find this at all. So we don't know what else human milk oligosaccharides can do on an antimicrobial level, and we're trying to do that a little bit more systematically now, working with Victor on larger screens. Very interesting for us was that there was a synergistic effect between oligosaccharides and commercially available antibiotics. In other words, you can lose less of the antibiotic in the presence of human milk oligosaccharides. And in the emerging crisis of antibiotic resistance, this could be a very potential way to enhance antibiotic activity. All right, back to this slide. They have antimicrobial effects, but they also have anti-adhesive effects. I'll show you that in a separate cartoon. So usually when you have pathogens or bacteria in general, 
in the intestine, the intestine is constantly moving, right? It constantly tries to move stuff through and get out. So somehow, if you were a bacterium, you had to hold on somewhere, or you wanted to hold on somewhere to be able to proliferate and, and potentially invade. So very often, what bacteria do is they have lectins, so glyco, uh, glycan-binding proteins, that bind to the glycocalyx on epithelial cells. And that binding allows them to stick and eventually proliferate and invade. Now, it happens that you have human milk oligosaccharides present in very high concentrations. They serve as soluble decoy receptors because they mimic some of those glycocalyx structures. And that way, bacteria bind to your human milk oligosaccharides can no longer bind to the glycocalyx and get washed out without causing disease. That had been shown before on Campylobacter and a few other pathogens. We've worked with Lars Ekman to specifically look at EPAC, both in tissue culture and now also in animal models, um, where we look at different human, uh, human epithelial cell lines and see that EPAC attaches less in the presence of human milk oligosaccharides. And not only does it attach less, it also creates less lesions on the epithelial, epithelial cell surface. And that's significant. So you see these light green spots here is when the EPEC starts to scratch in your epithelial cells and causes lesions, and that is not the case, or to a lesser extent, when you put oligosaccharides on it. Then we also started working with a good friend and colleague of mine, Sashi Ramani at Baylor, and she wanted to test whether oligosaccharides also inhibit addition, uh, adhesion of rotavirus. And specifically, she was interested in a rotavirus that is tropic, to the neonatal space, first four weeks of life in a region in India. So it's this G10P11 strain. And to our great surprise, we found that oligosaccharides actually increased infectivity in tissue culture. Specific oligosaccharides would increase rotavirus infectivity. We did this a few times and modified the model quite a bit because we didn't believe it, but it was true. And we then looked at a mother-infant cohort in that region in India, and we found that there is a distinct difference in the oligosaccharide profile in moms that have infants with rotavirus infection that is either, either asymptomatic or symptomatic. And the same oligosaccharides that increased infectivity in vitro were higher expressed in moms that had infants with highly symptomatic rotavirus infections. So for the first time, we think that there is a neonatal rotavirus strain that exploits specific human milk oligosaccharides to increase infectivity. Does that mean that the pathogens are winning and getting ahead in the host microbe arms race? Are we lost? Are we doomed? Or can we actually use that knowledge to develop new vaccination strategies? We've seen this in tissue culture as well, that if we use Rotovac, which is a life attenuated uh, vaccine that is used in that area in India, oligosaccharides can boost the response of that vaccine. So can we develop vaccine strategies that include human milk oligosaccharides? How are we doing on time, actually? I don't have a timer here in front of me. We are almost done. Hmm? Sorry, we are almost done. Almost done? Okay. You think. Okay, so uh, oligosaccharides also have an effect direct on epithelial cells, and I'm going to skip that one. And they also have an effect on immune cells, either locally in the intestine or systemically. Remember, about 1% of the oligosaccharides get absorbed. This is some data that came out of... Uh, uh, out in PLOS One in 2014, where they specifically looked at concentrations of oligosaccharides in breast milk compared to infant urine compared to plasma. And they found that 2FL here, for example, has about one to two milligram per liter uh, in plasma, which is one to two microgram per ml. We've done some studies on bone marrow-derived macrophages and looked at LPS stimulation, IL-6, IL-1 beta uh, response, and how specific oligosaccharides uh, can suppress that. And you see the IC50 for that is around 20 microgram per ml in culture, which is way above uh, what we have in the infant. So sometimes I would question what we find in tissue culture, what oligosaccharides do, if that really is relevant of what we find in the infant afterwards. Not only that, we also find that a lot of HMO preps are contaminated with LPS itself. LPS is pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's extremely resistant. 
accumulates during isolation processes and also during the production. And we've tested this here, uh, purchased the same oligosaccharide from four different vendors, and we did, in some cases, get pro-inflammatory effects, and in other cases, anti-inflammatory effects, which is kind of important. Right? What is it now? Is it pro-inflammatory or is it anti-inflammatory? It can't be that the source of your material determines that. We then used a uh, polymyxin B column to get rid of all the LPS in those preps, and now all preps have a pro uh, an anti-inflammatory effect. So it matters, and I think some of the literature is kind of uh, muddled there a little bit with impure preps that were used. What do we know about oligosaccharides and immune cell interactions? They inhibit leukocyte rolling and adhesion. There is papers on lymphocyte maturation, NK cells, Th1 response, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, other stuff in macrophages and mice. I think the, the, the uh, material in the literature is still a little confusing and not very well curated. And uh, the whole thing might also have an effect, effect on adults. So in my lab, we drank some 2FL ourselves in water, 2 gram, and we looked at how much of that comes out in our urine. And we found about 5 milligram coming out. 5 milligram in 5 liter blood volume. That's about the same concentration of what we find in the infant study. So this might have effects on the adult as well. I'm wrapping up. And this might have effects really not just on the infant, short and long term. It has effects throughout the entire life cycle, potentially on moms, during lactation, during pregnancy. We find oligosaccharides in amniotic fluid. It might have effects there, short and long term. And we now have synthetic oligosaccharides available that we can use uh, really throughout the life cycle as therapeutics. So in conclusion, HMOs are the third most abundant component in human milk. The maternal genetic and environmental factors that drive the variation in oligosaccharide composition are not yet fully understood. HMOs act as prebiotics, antimicrobials, and anti-adhesives and contribute to shaping the infant microbiome, which can indirectly affect the immune system. HMOs can directly modulate uh, immune cell interactions and responses, both locally in the gut as well as systemically and in organs and tissues other than the gut. We need combined approaches of preclinical cohort and clinical studies to fully assess HMO effects, functions, and claims. I think we're really lacking behind the science uh, compared to all the marketing claims that we see. And last but not least, HMOs can serve as natural templates for novel, novel therapeutics beyond the first 1,000 days of life with potential health implications throughout the entire life cycle. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lars.